I don't feel bad when I kill people in video games. Can developers now stop trying to make me feel like a monster when I do the one thing their game forces me to do in order to complete it? I'm not going to flog myself in penance for the dozen NPCs I've taken a claw hammer to. I don't believe this even needs to be pointed out, judging from the lack of people suffering from PTSD after stomping one too many Goombas. Tackling the ludo-narrative dissidents that exist in video games isn't even an original idea. Spec Ops The Line already trod that ground. And even though I despise that game, I can tell you it does a better job depicting video games being a traumatic hell over The Last of Us Part II, and in a far less shamefully manipulative way. But every game that attempts this plot is still undone by the same fatal flaw. As Shakespeare once put it, the moment you pick up the controller, the heart turns off. The Last of Us Part II is brought to you by Taylor Guitars. Normally, the only entertainment to begin with a sponsorship plug are YouTube videos. What does Ellie know? I told her. Her immunity meant nothing. I'm still surprised that Ellie ever bought that story. Wouldn't she wonder why Marlene did everything to get her to the Fireflies? And had such hope for a cure now if there were immune people already with the Fireflies. If I ever were to lose you, I surely lose myself. Pearl Jam's Lightning Bolt album must have had a real impact on Joel, since it released on October 15th, 2013, not even a month before the outbreak started. He also chose a track that might as well have been selected by the Council for Boating Music Selection. What is the downside to eating a clock? It's time consuming. The same could also be said about large chunks of this game. Ellie's half of the game in particular is plagued with incredibly slow sections with nothing to do but search for supplies while having conversations with Dina in between flashbacks. I heard you had quite a night after I left. She kissed me. It was just Dina being Dina. She didn't mean anything by it. I was talking about your fight with Seth. Wait, you kissed Dina? How could Jesse learn about the altercation Ellie had with Seth last night but not the cause of it? Ellie is living in a garage in the middle of a Wyoming winter. There's no insulation in there. That's going to be freezing cold. Wyoming may be considered flyover country, but this game depicts it as still existing as it did sometime around the turn of the 20th century. Towns don't look this retro unless it's a set for film. You can look up Jackson, Wyoming on Google Maps and it looks nothing like this. What you got there? Bigot sandwiches. This is now the second most meme line about sandwiches in video games. What is the point of sending people on patrol outside Jackson for wandering infected when they live behind high walls and electric fences that infected could never breach? They send Ellie and Dina out on patrol with around 10 bullets. Abby is... dense, to say the least, in terms of body type. Did no one back at the WLF base ever complain about the extra rations she had to be sneaking? That's a 3,000 calorie diet at the least to sustain those gains. Where have you been? Abby is voiced by Laura Bailey, once again appearing in a game with Troy Baker. Assuming he's in there, how do we get to him? We can corner one of the patrols and get confirmation, and then, I don't know, maybe find a way to lure him out. Abby and Owen play the pronoun game to refrain from saying the name of the man they're looking for, as if the game is hiding anything by refusing to use a proper name. There are only two male characters living in Jackson that we know about, and only one of them has potential enemies that might want him dead that could be important to the plot. At some point, you have to explain how infected people are surviving exposure to the cold. This is a Wyoming winter, yet the infected humans have no problem at all surviving in freezing temperatures. And fungus doesn't do well in the cold, so spreading spores shouldn't even be a thing. So, Naughty Dog, what new gameplay mechanics can we expect in The Last of Us Part 2? Well, we've added a jump button. And? You were expecting more than that? I don't want to sound too entitled, but amazingly, I did expect your sequel to have progressed further than Zelda 2 in terms of new features after seven years. For all the millions of words crafted complaining about certain moments in the game's plot, few of them have been spent on what I find to be the game's biggest flaw, how shockingly unchanged the gameplay is from the first game. I guess it's a lot easier to put together a one-sentence spoiler that you can post online for shock value rather than typing out a paragraph on the lack of new gameplay mechanics. Is weed still illegal even after the fall of civilization? This guy Eugene had to hide his grow farm under a house far outside of town. If you are going to depict your character smoking weed, you can at least show the effects of it. I think these two fail to in hell, since they seem completely unaffected afterwards. Abby comes under attack by more infected than there has ever been people living in Wyoming. This infected swarm feels forced to quickly put Abby into contact with Joel by sheer coincidence in a manner that would lead to him letting his guard down instead of being on guard against an outsider. Must have been one popular ski lift to have installed an old-fashioned door bar to keep people out. I'm Tommy. That's Joe. I know we're in a life or death situation here, but there is always time for proper introductions. This world might as well have tied a bow on Joel and pushed him into Abby's arms. Yeah, I'll run him all the way to Jackson. We need to barricade that door. Tommy, we cannot stay here. Horses ain't making it all no, that my way. My friends, my friends are at a mansion just north of here. 
It's fenced in. We have the whole perimeter secure. It's a ball in place. Good work. Sure. Let's head to a building full of armed people we don't know and then completely trust them. Joel and Tommy had to suspect that fireflies might come after Joel for what he did. Joel himself stated that when he killed Marlene. So while I'm willing to believe he might have softened over the years, letting his guard down this much just makes him look dumb. Ellie and Dina had the kind of sex where you don't remove all of your clothes. Antarctica style. When Jesse bursts in and tells him Joel never checked in, Ellie and Dina get up barefooted and step on the floor where Dina broke open a jar of joints right before they got romantic. Why don't you say whatever speech you got rehearsed? Get this over with. The only person whose death has caused a bigger uproar this year than Joel's is that poor guy who was kneeled on by the police. Through determination and hard work, but mainly lack of interest since I was never emotionally invested in the series, I managed to avoid all spoilers for the game. And on top of that, I lack an agenda to push that would lead me to rating the game a perfect 10 or 0 on Metacritic. So I'm one of the few that got to experience this scene as the developers intended. And my reaction wasn't the horrified and shocked one they'd hoped for. It was more or less indifference, since everyone had suspected Joel would be killed off in a sequel. So much so that every trailer for The Last of Us 2 had to lie to your face about Joel's role in the game. What's going on here is basically a repeat of what happened at the start of the first game, where Joel's daughter died and turned him into a hardened person. Only this time Joel is the one dying so Ellie can suffer inside. The problem being that we only briefly controlled and got to know Sarah. Just enough so her death would be a sad moment in Joel's overall life. Joel can never be just a sad moment due to the fact that Joel was a well-established character players spent a good amount of time getting emotionally attached to, and he is murdered just to give Ellie something to do. And if you are going to kill a major character early in the game, have the balls to let them lie and don't fill your game full of flashbacks to when he was still alive. That only reeks of cowardice, since you clearly wanted to feature Joel in the game more than just a brief moment at the start. Ellie arrives at the lodge but encountered none of the giant swarm of infected that chased Joel, Tommy, and Abby here. I have to ask, why a golf club? And how did Abby get so many swings with it without duct taping a pair of scissors to it somewhere? I can't swing a lead pipe more than a few times before it breaks in game. Rage can temporarily deafen you so you can't overhear any plot important details others are saying around you. They have the guys that we would need to do this smart. We'd be leaving Jackson vulnerable. To what? The only thing you have to deal with are infected, and they sure as hell are not getting through the walls. Now, we don't even know for certain that they're from Seattle. Washington Liberation Front. That's what you said was on those patches. The letters WLF on their patches could mean anything, but it raises a good point. Why would Joel's killers wear identifying patches that could lead those wanting retribution back to them? Ellie. You go. I go. End of story. There needs to be more context for why Dina is willing to follow Ellie to Seattle. The game has established they have feelings for each other, but so far all they've done is get high and have sex on the job, which doesn't establish them as soulmates. That's a slow night shift at Arby's. So you're just gonna sneak out of here? Hmm? Yeah. On foot? Yeah. I told the stable to let you out with your horse. Tommy's wife, who runs Jackson, was against sending people to Seattle to hunt down Joel's killers until Tommy snuck off to do it himself, asking her to keep Ellie from leaving. The moment she has skin in the game, she's perfectly fine with sending two kids out to do the job she knows would need more people. Grab some ammo too. But only a couple rounds. They were only on the road for two weeks, yet it's already mid-spring in Seattle. Somehow Tommy got through the closed quarantine zone gate as well as the other ones in this section. Ellie had to find a paper with the passcodes written down on it and has to turn on generators to power them. And later finds two men that Tommy just tortured for the passcode to a door that wasn't powered up and is still closed. Gas is only good for around two to three years before oxidation ruins it. Any gas left around is over 25 years old at this point. It's one of the ones that killed Joel. It's kind of hard to believe Tommy and Ellie memorized every one of the people who were there to kill Joel, other than Abby. Both of them only got a brief look at the rest of the group, and were both knocked unconscious right afterward. You ask this guy a question, but you don't make him say it, you make him write it down. And then you ask this guy, and if the facts match, you're telling the truth. Since one of these two were part of the group that killed Joel, I would assume Tommy would have spent most of his interrogation tricks asking about the whereabouts of the rest of them. Not a gate code. Ellie and Dina are knocked off their horse by a bomb, sending Dina flying over the edge of the overpass. For whatever reason, the WLF soldiers couldn't locate a girl who would be shaken up by a bomb blast and fell who knows how far. How'd you find us? You wear identifying patches on your shoulders. Dina kills the guy in charge, but falls through the glass ceiling after Jordan shoots the glass she was standing on. Considering Dina is pregnant, she's really fortunate neither of these two falls have caused a miscarriage. Instead of putting a round in Dina, Jordan decides to slowly strangle her to death. The Polaroid supply must have been secured right after the fall of civilization, because Leia sent one of herself to Jordan that allowed Ellie to find her, and had photos of all of her friends that were there for Joel's murder in her bag that she helpfully wrote their names down on. 
The previous people boarded up this theater by stacking chairs in front of the door. Ellie just sticks the legs of one chair through the door handles. I guess they overthought their barricade. I think I'm pregnant. Dina only started experiencing morning sickness after arriving in Seattle. She broke up with Jesse a week before the game started, and you can assume a few days to a week lapsed after Joel's death and them leaving for Seattle. And then they spent over two weeks on the road. Dina should be over a month into her pregnancy already. She should have known well before now. Wow. Oh, Joel. You'd love watching a movie in this place. Ellie doesn't know what a stage production is or never learned in her lifetime. This weirdly timed flashback exists to establish the surrogate father-daughter relationship between Ellie and Joel, which is what I thought the first game already accomplished. So this ends up being a huge waste of time and to manipulate you into feeling sad over his loss, which also is unnecessary since if you like Joel, you already felt sad after watching him die. Joel knocked Ellie into the water earlier. Yet inside the museum, her cassette player works fine despite getting soaked with everything else on her. I'll go get him. You keep tracking them, okay? This is one of those games where people will unironically describe it as getting good after 10 hours, and I have to agree. Once Ellie leaves Dina in the theater to go find Tommy, the pacing improves dramatically. What the hell are you doing here? I think I'd let you do this on your own. This scene was put together just so it could be used in trailers to imply Joel was present during Ellie's vengeance quest. Truck that was working just fine a second ago now has a stalled engine at the worst possible moment. What follows is your standard Naughty Dog action set piece, but it's what they do better than anyone. Why wouldn't Ellie exit through the missing door on her side? It was knocked off during the chase. I always prefer a story be told in the present. Minimizing flashbacks or cuts to past events to zero if at all possible. If you play the Left Behind DLC story from the first game, then you should be very familiar with how this game tries to tell its story by injecting flashback sequences into the game at intervals, telling a story set across three days for Ellie that is constantly interrupted by flashbacks to moments during the past four years. Then later the game switches to Abby being followed for that same three day period, while she also has flashbacks to earlier times. It makes for a disjointed experience that interrupts the pacing of the present story just as it was picking up. You know they were useless. Maybe if you, you just would have given them more time, they could have figured Evan. something out. There was no cure. Oh yeah, that immunity issue. Shame that only gets to be brought up and resolved during flashbacks. Ellie was struggling to close this door against infected when one tackles her from the side, while pressing her up against the window. The infected that were kept from getting in through the door don't enter despite Ellie not holding it shut any longer. <laughs> that arrow through Ellie's shoulder won't hinder her at all after she rips it out. This girl in the hospital is playing Hotline Miami, a game full of ultraviolence. My precious Ludo narrative. She should feel bad about that. Her lifespan was nearly as long as the PlayStation Vita itself. Yeah, breathing spores. Did it ever occur to any of them that Joel might have kept the immune girl he rescued from the Fireflies with him? That maybe the girl who begged them to stop killing him might be her? There should be an arrow wound on Ellie's right shoulder. At least give me time to reflect on the traumatic experience you just showed me before hitting me with an abrupt flashback. Ellie found a tape recorder ironically left behind by Abby that reveals the truth of what Joel did. Abby doesn't strike me as the audio diary type. Making a vaccine. Would have killed you. So I stopped them. I bet everyone was looking forward to this conclusion being wrapped up in a flashback in the sequel after Joel's death. I'll go back. But we're done. Since Ellie learned the truth that Joel lied about her immunity meaning nothing and a cure could be found because of her, how come she is completely despaired over creating a vaccine? Despite the tape claiming that Joel killed the only man who could create a cure, there can't be zero doctors left in the world. Get to the marina through here. No, we're taking the boat. You heard them right, they're talking about Tommy. We don't know that. Who else is it gonna be? If it is him, he'll be gone by the time we get there. The aquarium Abby is holed up in is located near the marina. Going after Tommy will take you to the same location. Instead, they split up and both end up in the same place later. Not that I'm complaining. The pacing is a lot better when you don't have Jesse tagging along for the ride either. Driving a motorboat over barbed wire stretched across the water would result in fouling the propeller. 
Maybe I would care about killing Abby's dog if I hadn't already killed several dogs at this point. I've been laying trip mines in my scent trail so they'll walk right into it. I think this game underestimated how many players would turn into sociopaths at this point, which also messes up the next big scene. Point to where she is. This tactic would only work if Owen wasn't standing close enough to see where Mel might point to on the map. Ellie has killed many women throughout this game already, any one of which can also have been pregnant in an earlier stage where it wasn't as visibly obvious. They got what they deserved. But she gets to live. Yeah. Ellie herself heard Owen and Mel mention an island. There's an island right off the coast of Seattle. It's not hard to figure out where Abby might be. No one will cry for Jesse's death at Abby's hands. Even Dina, the mother of his child. His entire character was to be a sperm donor. You killed my friends. We let you both live. And you wasted it! What did you think was going to happen? You'd show up in Jackson, kill Joel, and no one would care? Dad? Dad? Do I really need to sympathize with someone like Abby? Maybe Naughty Dog felt they missed an opportunity in the first game. I want to go back and play as that cannibalistic pedophile. What was his story? And how can I learn to sympathize with him and why he started creeping on minors and eating people? Would you look at that? Abby had a father too. And he was a doctor working with the fireflies. He protects zebras, loves his daughter, collects coins, and totally recommended cutting a girl's brain out while she was unconscious without even asking if she was okay with that. I'm aware of the situation. And you're okay with killing her? No, I'm okay with developing a vaccine that'll help save millions of lives. How many fireflies have died for less? That was their choice. Are you asking me? Or are you telling me this is how it's gonna be? I am begging you to buy in. Was there a particular reason you needed to rush into a life-ending surgery? Ellie wasn't going anywhere, and you could always run more tests and perhaps come up with a method that wouldn't kill her, like a simple biopsy for instance. And creating a vaccine isn't easy. As seen with our own real-life pandemic, it takes years of work even with access to current technology. How would they succeed with only one doctor and no facilities to manufacture a vaccine? I'm gonna go tell Joel. Why? He traveled across the country with her. He has a right to know. And you're not going to wake up Ellie to tell her? Doesn't she have a right to know? The game tries so hard to build empathy for Abby. She wants to kill Joel because Joel killed her father. Mind you, Joel never sought her father out and only killed him because he attacked him as he tried to save Ellie. So Joel committed second degree murder at best. Whereas with Abby, it was very much in the first degree. You may think that difference to be pretty minor, but in storytelling, premeditated murder where you intentionally prolong the suffering of your victim is a hard thing to rehabilitate a character from. Imagine being stuck in this world with only a PlayStation Vita and a copy of Hotline Miami, and without a Nintendo DS. No wonder everyone is killing each other. I actually cleared you for active duty. Barely. Why would any military organization clear Mel for active combat duty? Shouldn't an expecting mother in this world be a fairly important thing? What with humanity being on the brink of extinction and all? You know what pregnant women shouldn't be doing? Sitting in a truck bed as it bounces over rough terrain and shooting rifles. Car crashes are not great either. I'm surprised these people didn't kill Mel and her baby before Ellie could. Abby, like Joel, doesn't understand the value of carrying a knife with her like Ellie does, so she has to craft shivs from scissors she finds. To the game's credit, they did fix the issue of only finding the broken half of a pair of scissors that can only make one shiv like in the first game. Here you find unbroken scissors and make two complete shivs. This girl's entire character is that she owns a PlayStation Vita, and she's been stuck on the same Hotline Miami level for days. Isaac, the leader of the WLF, was already introduced torturing a man, which is enough to establish that he's an asshole. Then they make him eat an apple for even more asshole points. Though I have to wonder where they're getting apples in Seattle this early in spring. They can't be importing those. Let me go after him. I'll walk him back in, we'll get to the No. Bottom. You would think the character who killed Joel would be given something interesting to do to justify why we were even playing as her. Her story has almost nothing to do with Ellie until the very end. With Abby's fear of heights, how did she ever climb up into the Ferris wheel gondola? I found something pretty awesome. Owen somehow found the aquarium in the time it took Abby to jump into the water after him, which was less than a minute. While making her way to the aquarium, Abby is ambushed by scars. One hits her in the head with a hammer, which would normally kill you. I mean, I've done it enough times in this game already. It only sends Abby into another flashback, even though we only finished one a second ago. Did you tell the others? Everyone's on board. Mel included. Everyone should share the burden of my personal vendetta. The Scar Lady only fired four rounds from her revolver at Yara and Lev, yet her gun is empty once Abby grabs hold of her. Yara and Lev had to be the laziest addition to the game for me. They're only here so Abby can have someone to save, especially so in Lev's case, since he ends up playing the same role Ellie played in the first game, someone there to humanize a much harsher character. I think Abby could have worked a lot better had they not tried to rehash the character arc of Joel and Ellie. 
After killing the Scar who took her backpack, Abby finds all of her guns still inside of it. If that woman had Abby's weapons, why use a hammer? Here we have Owen, father of Mel's baby, clearly bummed out over his life decisions, drunk and done fighting Scars. And Abby, who still has fresh road marks on her neck from an attempted hanging. Both are down to bang in that awkward, darkest recesses of amateur Pornhub way. If you make the boobs small and muscular enough, you get disqualified from the Metro Last Light Test. Abby has a nightmare about Yara and Lev of all people that make her go back and check on them. The rest of Abby's part in the game is dedicated to helping these two kids. This is the way the game plans to make you feel sympathetic for Abby. She gets to play fetch with the dogs, save kids, and question authority. But it all comes across as manipulative, like someone donating a bunch of money to charity after getting caught in a scandal. Lev refuses to use technology because Seraphites are a cult of Ludites that forbid the use of old world technology. So he always uses a bow. Except here where he shoots at Abby with a gun that he will never use again. Mel somehow made it to the aquarium on her own even though it took Abby all evening to reach it after fighting the whole way here. And Mel is pregnant. What if I can get you there in two hours? The Wolf Hospital, right? On the west side? How? We built bridges. High up, it's how we get around the flooding and you people. The WLF never noticed the scars using sky bridges made from construction cranes to get around their checkpoints, even the one right above the hospital they occupy. Enjoy your spore-contaminated mask. Since Abby took it off a corpse in a spore-filled room, the inside of the mask would be contaminated now. Because they want to kill you. With me, they're just worried about a backgammon rematch. She's been AWOL since yesterday. Abby figured no one would have noticed that she went AWOL two days ago, even after being ordered by Isaac not to go after Owen. You get caught. I had nothing to do with this. Of course. I'm sure they won't suspect Abby's longtime friend of releasing her. Isaac zeroed in on Nora being the one who told Abby about Owen the moment she brought him up. There's a reason we haven't touched this area yet. It was ground zero for the whole city. Where they brought the first infected before anyone knew better. I think she's referring to the part where everyone pretended that the zombie pandemic was over because it was putting too much strain on the economy. How do infected people survive being locked in the lower level of a hospital for two decades? The game has already established that the infected still need to eat to survive. Good thing that boat was there, since they couldn't go back across the sky bridges, which really would have put a damper on the idea of getting back to Yara in time to save her life. What are they fighting about? Oh, fuck you, Yara. I wish to leave you behind. Love doesn't want to leave Seattle. Owen invited them to come to Santa Barbara. Lev is the one who ran away from the scars in their island after shaving his head, but refuses to leave with Owen for Santa Barbara due to his mother still being in the cult. What was his plan? Become an apostate and live in WLF territory? He may fall for your little act with these kids, but I don't. There's nothing to fall for. Isaac's top scar killer suddenly had a change of heart. Nothing to do with Owen, right? Lady, Abby spent all day and risked her life to get medical supplies for that girl. I don't think Owen is such a great catch that he's worth that kind of effort. How's your arm? Not there. Do you mind helping me look for him? Yara was just arguing with Lev down the hallway from Abby and Mel. How could she lose sight of him? Why doesn't Lev want to go to Santa Barbara? He's worried about her mom. About what'll happen to her because of us. Shouldn't Lev have been worried about his mother before running away? This feels like an excuse to give Abby something to do on the third day. But then again, finding Owen on the first day and then getting a trauma kit to remove Yara's arm on the second also felt like excuses. Well, why do you think he did it now? Shaved his head, I mean. Last week, he got assigned his role in the community. He wanted to be a soldier like me, but they decided he was to be a wife to one of the elders. It's tradition. Normally, a conservative religious cult like yours would never assign a woman to soldier duty, but Yara was, while Le was to become someone's child bride. Mel's wrong, you know. You're a good person. No, Mel was right. Premeditated murder is sort of a moral event horizon. You have to at least show some remorse before you deserve sympathy or a second chance. Lev! What's he doing? He's going after her. After who? His mom. She's gonna kill him, Abby. We'll head him off. How are you going to head him off when Lev is already on his way back to the island with your only boat? You have to walk to the marina to get a new one. Manny is basically a loose end the game wraps up so it can continue this Lev and Abby plotline. So he is unceremoniously shot in the head by Tommy. Abby told Yara to wait on the docks while she dealt with the sniper. Somehow Yara found an alternate way around when there shouldn't have been one to save Abby from Tommy. Who was that? Shit. It doesn't matter. Let's 
Just get and get back to the aquarium. Abby clearly recognized Tommy. She has to know that she and her friends are being targeted and should warn Owen and Mel before heading out in the boat after Lev. Judy Baker, stop. It's just pushing her off of me. She hit the table. Lev came all this way and only succeeded in accidentally killing his mother by knocking her into a table before Abby arrived. If this didn't feel like a lame excuse for conflict before, it sure does now. Shouldn't we head back for our boat? No. I hear fighting back there. The devs realize that retracing your steps back to the boat you took to the island would make far more sense than cutting through the most inhabited part of the island where the WLF is attacking. But their excuse for why you can't go back makes no sense. Simply because you hear a little fighting behind you doesn't mean you should go through even more fighting that's in front of you. Glad I spent over an hour making my way to the hospital earlier to save Yara, only for her to die now. Abby put her gun down in front of Isaac. After he was shot by the dying Yara, Abby runs away without picking up her gun, yet she still has it after the cutscene ends. Losing your backpack in a cutscene means you lose all of your weapons, even the ones you kept in a hip holster. A hammer and sickle, huh? Interesting choice of weapons for this fight. Abby's soaking wet jacket isn't going to make Lev any warmer. If only you had taken a minute to go back and warn them that they were being targeted for what you did in Jackson. Abby is only able to track Ellie down to the theater because Ellie drew unnecessary lines on the map she dropped on the floor. Tommy survives this. Stay here. Watch the exits, don't let her leave. Abby told Lev to stay in the theater to make sure Ellie didn't escape, instead following them down to a lower floor, and somehow letting Dina get past him to attack Abby with a knife. She's pregnant. Good. Abby! Don't ever let me see you again. Just because she's pregnant doesn't mean you can't finish off Ellie. There has not been any significant character growth for Abby that would stay her hand from killing Ellie when it didn't for Joel. A year later and Ellie, Dina, and her child are living happily together in what is the most unneeded epilogue since Red Dead Redemption 2. I hope this isn't turning into a trend for AAA video games. The sudden long epilogue chapter that leads into wrapping everything up. Tommy was shot in the knee by an arrow and the side of the face with a bullet while Dina was hit in the shoulder with an arrow and pregnant and Ellie was beaten to a pulp. Tommy wouldn't even be capable of walking. How did they all get back to Jackson alive? He told me about a woman that he traded with while he was moving through California. Described her as built like an ox, traveling with a kid with scars across his face. That seems incredibly unlikely that someone who ran into Abby in California would then make their way up to Wyoming and tell Tommy about it. It took years of waiting before Abby got a single lead on Joel's location. Reckon it's easy. Forget about her. You sitting all comfy way out here? Hey. I'll make her pay. Tommy. That's what you said when we got back to Jackson. Tommy has gone through about three to four different changes when it comes to getting justice for Joel. At first, he was reluctant to do it without more people and permission from his wife, then to sneaking away to do it by himself, to then wanting to head back to Jackson without killing Abby, and now wanting to kill Abby again, but not being able to do it himself due to his injuries, and expecting Ellie to do it on her own and getting upset when she shows reluctance to do this again. Another flashback after a time jump. I made paper snowflakes in kindergarten that were less cut up than this. You've got a family. She doesn't get to be more important than that. Abby only killed your child's father. You were down for revenge when it didn't even involve you. Abby and Lev are looking for the fireflies and use an abandoned safe house they find to radio them, which is intercepted by the Rattlers, who somehow get to that house within a minute of Abby mentioning it to ambush them. A little late to be introducing a new faction of villains, don't you think? I don't know if you caught such a subtle detail, but the Rattlers all wear police body armor and are depicted as slavers the worst and most immoral group in the game. It's the only moment that I can say I felt the game whispering a political message in my ear. Abby should have learned a valuable lesson about leaving notes and maps around that detail where you were going after she found Ellie through the map she left behind. Abby and Lev have been living in this boathouse for months until they were captured by the Rattlers two months ago. Somehow they apparently never learned of all the heavily armed slavers living right next door to them. <laughs> Something funny? Looks like you show your pants. This is actually my favorite moment in the game. This is how Ellie should be depicted, using her immunity to her advantage and being a smartass. Blonde, arms like mine. She had a, a scrawny kid with it. cuts by his mouth. That's the voice of Travis Willingham. And since the Rattlers appear to be former police officers, you could say he's once again playing a man in uniform. What a waste. I never even got to play as that slaver in order to learn about his life and sympathize with him. Why do they always keep the weapons locker right outside of the prisoner cells? And they keep gassed up boats right next to where they tie people to stakes to leave them to die. Nice of those horrible slavers to respect Lev's gender identity for the two months they enslaved him for. The scars wouldn't even give him that. 
Subverting expectations isn't the same thing as disappointing people, which seems to be the new trend in popular entertainment. Finding a razor blade in my salad is subverting my expectations, but it isn't exactly something I'm going to applaud you for. This game took a risk, betting everything, every element of its narrative that it can make you sympathize with Abby and care about her as much as the first game did with Joel. Abby's half of the game is less dark, more about stopping people from being harmed rather than inflicting harm upon them. She plays fetch with dogs instead of killing them. She gets to grow and change her outlook on the scars and save children. She even has a better gameplay sections, with more combat and better pacing. But even with all of that, in my case, it was a complete failure. Abby never did anything that redeemed her murder of Joel in my eyes, and the devs could only come up with pairing her with a cute kid and hope that the first game's magic would rub off on her. Forgiving someone who loved you and who you love back over a lie is a far cry different from forgiving someone you never knew, who showed up one day and tortured someone you loved to death, destroyed your entire world and who never once sought forgiveness or showed remorse. All the epilogue does is punish Ellie even further, since Dina leaves her along with the baby, and Ellie loses two of her fingers, making her unable to play guitar, her only remaining connection to Joel. I understand the game's message that revenge is bad, but it really only comes across as bad when Ellie is the one seeking it. Abby got her vengeance. It was practically served up to her on a silver plate. She was never once sorry for it, and wasn't punished for it to the same degree. And will not get to have a life bonding with Lev just like Ellie would have had with Joel if not for her. To me, Abby is a fundamentally horrible person that did nothing to earn mercy from Ellie, and certainly didn't earn this ending. 